Hello and welcome to the East Somerville Main Street's Candidate Forum and Debate for Ward 1 School Committee. My name is Joe Lynch from the Somerville Media Center, commonly known as SCAT TV. I am a member of the Board of Directors there, I'm host of a weekly talk show called Greater Somerville, and I, in full disclosure I am the Vice Chair of the Ward 5 Somerville City Democratic Committee. It is my pleasure to, to be asked to moderate this event. And I'm thrilled to see all of you here participating in Democracy in Action. Thank you very much to Teresa and Devin and all the folks at East Somerville Main Streets. Thank you to the staff from Somerville Media Center who are here tonight taping the event. The event will be made available, the taped event will be made available to the public later this week. And as an added treat, real time, is East Somerville Main Streets Facebook living this event? We're trying, we're trying. So Facebook users, if you're tuning in later, that's fine. Welcome, get comfortable, and relax. It is now my pleasure to welcome your candidates for Ward 1 School Committee in the great city of Somerville, Emily Ackman and Ken Salvano. Hello. Thank you very much. Thank you, candidates. Now, if you can do me a big favor. This is the candidates' night, and in order to give them and the public who will be viewing this recorded program the maximum amount of time needed to get their message across, I'm going to ask you to refrain from any audible applause, cheers, or other audience reactions to their statements or answers. And at the end of the program, I promise you I will give you enough time to show your appreciation to them. So here we go. The rules that were established by East Somerville Main Streets for the forum and debate are as follows. Each candidate will be invited to deliver a two minute opening statement. The questions were gathered, edited, and formatted by the East Somerville Main Streets organization and provided to me today. Each candidate will be allowed a two minute response to each question. The candidates will be asked the same question. There will be no rebuttals. There is a timekeeper visible to the candidates and to me and will signal to us when time is almost up and when they should stop. Each candidate will be invited to deliver a two minute closing. And at my discretion, due to the time constraints that we do have and with the candidates approval, we may dispense with that two minute closing. Candidates, are you ready to begin? Yes, sir. Excellent. Emily Ackman won the coin toss, so we're going to start with a two-minute opening statement from Emily Ackman. Thanks for having me. Uh, before I introduce myself, I would like to thank Connection and Justin for hosting this event, East Somerville Main Streets for organizing it, and the Somerville Media Center for helping with the organization and taping it, and of course, Joe, for moderating. I know it took a lot of work to get this together, and I really appreciate it. Hi. Uh, my name is Emily Ackman and I'm running for school committee in Ward 1 because I've spent my career as an educator and advocate for, for public schools. I was born and raised in Cambridge where I attended public school from kindergarten through high school. The excellent public education that I received in a very diverse urban school system, much like Somerville. Uh, in fact, when I moved back here to work for the Massachusetts Department of Education, I purposely chose East Somerville as a place to buy a home and raise a family because the cultural diversity and sense of community reminded me of the neighborhood that I grew up in. Somerville Public Schools have made great strides over the past 10 plus years. The high school has been ranked as a level one school for at least four years. Um, awards and grants are pouring in for everything from technology to safe routes to school to an exceptional history teacher to students traveling to St. Louis and Washington DC to represent our city as they compete on a national stage. While all of this is fantastic, there's still a lot of work to do to ensure that Somerville is meeting the needs of all students and their families. Since I announced my candidacy, I have been asked by many parents for help in deciphering Somerville schools' policies around preschool and kindergarten placement, after school classes, and other issues. Communication is key to fostering a supportive educational environment, and as a member of the school committee, I plan to support communication as a priority for the district. In addition to improved communication, I will work to ensure 
free pre-K for all families, and will advocate for improving after-school and summer programming, amongst other policies. Thank you. Ken Salvato, two minutes, opening statement. Again, I <clears throat> thank you for having me on. I appreciate the great crowd here. My name's Ken Salvato. I lived in this neighborhood all my life with my family down on Brook Street. Uh, my parents were uh, employees of the Somerville uh, School. <clears throat> There's so much going on in our schools right now. We got problems with anti-bullying. We got problems with drugs. We, we're giving out pay raises up there at the Board of Aldermen, the school committee, $10,000. There's so much needs to be done. I've been in the neighborhood. I've, I've, I've ran into this seat several times. I would like a chance to represent you. There's so many, so many issues that when I knock on doors, people tell me about the anti-bullying that's going on. They have to change their kids to schools. We got a great school system in this city. We got one of the best. People are leaving other cities to come to Somerville because of our great schools. We're going to be building a new, new high school very shortly. <clears throat> Excuse me, two hundred fifty-three million dollar high school. We got to keep them at that price tag because what's going to happen? They're going to raise it and raise it before you know it. It's going to be three hundred million dollars. We need to keep an eye on <clears throat> our tax dollars that they're, they're, they're spending. And what upsets me is that uh, they 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 procrastinate on issues that need to be looked at. For instance, with the New East Summer Community School, if you look at that school, it's it's falling apart. The playground looks horrendous. Those are the kind of issues that bother me. Now, I don't want that to happen with his soul. It's, it's just, it's, it's remarkable that they're voting for pay raises, but they won't give our teachers, uh, they won't give our teachers raises, or higher than teachers. Our classrooms ain't bad. They actually, uh, we got, what is it, the $68,529,000 they just passed from the board for the school committee. Uh, for, uh, it's a $3 million increase from last year. The administration is great. They do, they, they pump a lot of money into our school system. And we got the best schools, like I said. And I'm looking forward to representing this neighborhood. I'm working hard and I ask for your support. We need somebody that's going to be a full time school representative. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. We're going to move on to the first question. Ken, we're going to start with you. Emily opened up on the two minutes. First question How would you describe the role of an elected school committee member? What relevant qualities or experience do you bring to that role? And how does that set you apart from others? So it's describe the role, what are your qualities and experience, and what makes you different from your opponent. All right, describe the role. I, I believe a school representative should be a full-time school representative. That's what I believe. And what's the second? I'm sorry, Joe. No. Nope. What are the qualities and experience that you bring? The quality and experience that I bring, I've lived in this neighborhood for all my life. i got six brothers and one sister that lives down on Brook Street all my life. I know what the uh, issues are. I know the neighborhood from the back of my hand. I walk every street. This is my first time uh, running for this seat. This is my third time. I ran when it was an open seat six years ago. I ran again two years ago, and I'm running again on an open seat. I know what the, um, the school committee needs. I know what the the school system needs. You need somebody that's going to be there every day to walk our playgrounds, talk to our parents, have monthly meetings with our teachers so we get what's actually going on with the system. A lot of parents are, are, are confused on what's going on. They're not really being educated by our school representative. Our, our, the incumbent, great person, but he didn't communicate well with the constituents of the neighborhood. On the other hand, what I would what I would bring is I would have a monthly meeting with parents at the library. I would have a monthly meeting with the teachers at the library of the school to let them inform me what's actually going on. I've heard a lot of different stories from from parents that I'm doing on. It's 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 just crazy. You wouldn't believe how many issues that are in our school system. Okay, I got one more. Uh, mm -hmm. What sets you apart from what's, a gentleman? What sets me apart is our um, I've lived here all my life. I, I, I went to the school system. My brothers went to the school system. We've got a great school system. We've got great teachers. And we've got a great administration that pumps money into the program. Again, $3 million more dollars they're giving us this year. We've got to use that money properly. I mean, excuse me. We've got to use that money properly. And there's so many more programs that we can do. Half the school programs that we do, we can expand on those. And Anthony, we, we have a, an anti-bullying program. Our kids are getting bullied. What happens is they wait for three or four days to address the problem. Can I, I'm sorry. 
No, we can go on further, but we're going to get. Oh, all right, I'm sorry. I apologize. No problem. Sorry. I got no eye on that red flag over there. Emily, would you like the question repeated? If you don't mind. Sure thing. Thank How you. would you describe the role of an elected school committee member? Mm -hmm. What relevant qualities or experience do you bring to that role? And how does that set you apart? Uh, so to me, the role of the school committee member is to represent constituents and set policy um, for the schools, as well as a, a large part of what the school committee does is oversees the budget. And I think there are certain ways that people don't understand the politics of budgeting. And you know, much like Ken said, these issues matter. And if there's $3 million more million that's being allocate, allocated for this academic year, uh, the way those dollars are used there's politics in it and there are priorities. Um, so to me, the role of the school committee member is to represent constituents uh, and through policy that's crafted at the district level. Uh, the qualities and experience that I bring, I was an elementary school teacher, I was a preschool teacher, um, I ran an after school in New York City, uh, I have a PhD in education policy and I've spent a number of years researching uh, summer programs and sort of the best practices for high quality summer programs, which is something that I would love to bring to Somerville um, because I think their after school programs are strong, but I think we really need to be working on summer programs. Uh, I have experience working as a policy analyst at the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Uh, I have strong relationships there and, you know, I've heard great things. I know that uh, the State Department of Ed is very impressed with Somerville and the progress that they've made and uh, especially the progress at closing achievement gaps, which is something that's incredibly difficult to do in Somerville, uh, is really outstanding with that. Um, so those relationships matter. What sets me apart from the other candidate is uh, I have vast experience in education policy at all levels, at the district level, at the state level, uh, as a teacher, as an administrator. Um, and it's and as a researcher, and that experience is what I'd like to, to bring to some of those school committees. Thank you, Emily. I'm going to go on to the next question, and we'll go to Emily first. Yeah. The school committee recently reaffirmed their commitment to DACA, mm -hmm. which is the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Mm -hmm. Despite what's going on in Washington, D.C., is this something that you support? Yes, unequivocally. Um, so I was living in Arizona when uh, the state legislature there passed what was called the Senate Bill 1070, SB 1070, which they called the Show Your Papers Law, um, which uh, as someone who was involved with the public schools there at the time, I saw the ways in which uh, it harmed families who were trying to send their kids to public, school, public schools. And whether or not parents were undocumented um, children who were or were not undocumented were all affected. Uh, and our Supreme Court has made it clear that uh, undocumented students are welcome in our public schools. And so that is important for us to know uh, because that is something that we need to be advocating for. Um, so in short, yes, I, I stand for it. Oh, sorry, but when I was in Arizona, I had experience helping immigrant families um, make sure that they got their kids safely uh, to schools and didn't have to worry about um, immigration and things like that. And so I have experience and would be happy to support Somerville in sort of the innovative ways of translating and making sure that families feel safe in getting their kids to school regardless of immigration status. Thank you, Emily. Ken, repeat the question, please. Yes. The school committee, current school committee, recently reaffirmed their commitment to DACA, which is the Re Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Despite what was going, what is going on in Washington, D.C., is this something that you support? Yes, I, I support it. I truly support it. As we know, we do have a lot of uh, undocumented immigrants living in the city, but that should not harm the children of the city. Um, I, it's just we have to educate the parents a little more what's going on with that. A lot of parents are scared, they, they, they're puzzled, they really don't understand. They're, they're nervous, they're sending their kids out of the city because they feel more comfortable sending their kids to Cambridge than Somerville. 
That's what we need to change. We need to educate the parents of the day, of Rwanda, of the city, that things are all right. The summer will take care of your kids. We shouldn't penalize the kids for issues that are facing a national uh, issue. Definitely, definitely support that. It's just we need to educate the parents because the parents are scared. The parents really don't know where to, they can send their kids to school. And they get the run around when they try to get to, um, to get their kids in school. For instance, if they live in, and if they live in this neighborhood, why are the kids going to what they have? If they're living with the hill, why are the kids going to take you home? It's just, it's, it's my, it's confusion. It's, it's, it's truly confusing. Um, that's something that needs to be streamlined. That's something that needs to be corrected. And again, we need to educate the parents. Everything's going to be all right. Someone's going to take care of you. Again, I, I hate to sound like a broken record. Someone will get the best school system. And that's why the kids are coming to Somerville. That's why the parents are moving in. But the prices are going up. They're moving out. But that's an, another issue for the water all to take care of. Thank you, Ken. No, thank you. Ken, I'm gonna give you this next question. Ward one is the most ethnically diverse ward in the city. Over 70% of the students at the East Somerville Community School identify as Hispanic. What in your background would help you to deal with the specific issues of communities of color and students whose first language is not English. Do you feel there is systemic racism in our schools? And if so, how would you tackle that issue? It's a multiple question, but I think you get the gist of what's being asked. I can repeat it if you'd like. Give me one more time. Girl. Sure. Please. Ward one is the most ethnic, ethnically diverse ward in the city. Over 70% of the students at the East Somerville Community School identify as Hispanic. What in your background? would help you to deal with the specific issues of communities of color and students whose first language is not English? Do you feel there is systemic racism in our schools? And if so, how would you tackle that issue? That's a very good question. First of all, you gotta learn how to speak Spanish. And I'm learning by that rose, what's the word? I'm bad, but Rosetta, Rosetta, that thing. Rosetta. Thank you very much. That's I'm learning how to do that because it is a mixed population. I'm not on so many doors, and you know I can tell you this by November uh, by November seventh, I'll, I'll be able to speak Spanish. Not very well, but I'll be able to speak Spanish. I'm learning it as we go along. I'm crossing out of the grass alley. I'm learning a word every day, and it's important that we do speak different like uh, Spanish. Anyway, I think we have more Spanish, I think, than any other uh, language. But we have to again not forget about our English. Uh, children either because English should be the main uh, language that we speak also as we learn Spanish. I think that's important, very important, but it, you need to, you definitely need to learn that, that second language and I, and I, and I, uh, I applaud the uh, school system because they are teaching that to our kids. That's very important. I think they should teach that to our kids. I just don't want them to teach it in the same classroom. I'm hearing parents saying they're teaching English and Spanish in the same classroom. That kind of gets me a little uh, confused. So we need to, you know, not, we need to teach English, then after maybe for a period or two, teach Spanish so it doesn't confuse the kids. And that should be up to the parents' discretion. If they want their kids to learn Spanish, let them learn it. If they don't, then they don't. It has to be up to the parents. Being a school representative or uh, being a school elected official, we shouldn't force that on the parents to have their kids learn Spanish if they, if they do not want to learn it. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. No, thank you. Emily, one more time on that question. If you don't mind, as well. Sure thing. Thank you so much. Ward 1 is the most ethnically diverse ward in the city, with over 70% of the students at the East Somerville Community School identifying as Hispanic. What in your background would help you to deal with the specific issues of communities of color and students whose first language is not English? Do you feel there is systemic racism in our schools? And if so, how would you tackle that issue? Okay. Uh, so, what in my background would allow me to uh, work with communities of color? Um, so, I was raised in a very diverse community, and again, that was one of the reasons that I came here to raise a family. Um, I have two young children, and that's what's important to me. Um, 
My children both attend bilingual daycare. Uh, me, Espanol, as we model, but I, much like Ken, am working on my Spanish and I'm trying to improve it. Uh, once I get better at that, my hope is to also improve my Brazilian Portuguese because that's also to speak to communities, uh, the community that's predominant around here. Um, my personal background, uh, I taught in very socioeconomically and ethnically diverse schools. I've faced the unique challenges of dealing with um, with very diverse communities. It's, um, it is a blessing, but it is a challenge to meet everyone's needs. And I think we are blessed to have that challenge to meet. Um, let's see. That's what my background is. Um, oh, also when I was working in Arizona, uh, working with his, you know, mostly Hispanic communities and uh, helping their families feel more comfortable. Um, one of the things you mentioned about families whose first language is not English, um, the challenge with that is often that they're, just because a kid's home language is in English, that doesn't mean that they don't speak English. Most kids do speak English, even if their home language is not. Uh, at least most of the kids in our schools. Um, and so I think the challenge there is more making sure that we're communicating successfully with the parents. Uh, I want to touch on the systemic racism. I I hope not, but I i can't say no unequivocally that there is systemic racism. Um, uh, I can leave it at that. Thank you. Time's up. Thank you. I'm going to try to do one of the shorter questions here. I don't know who did these questions, but multiple part questions and not my forte. And with both candidates are saying, you know, they're not ours either. Yeah. Here's a simple question The effectiveness of homework for elementary school students is currently a matter of debate. Where do you stand on the issue? Let's go to Emily first. Uh, sure. So I've read and conducted a fair amount of research on that. Um, research says pretty consistently that the best homework for kids from kindergarten through fifth grade is reading. And reading can be tied into the curriculum. It's not just, you know, going home and reading books for fun, although better a kid goes home and reads the book for fun than doesn't do anything. Um, so my personal belief and hope is that uh, homework for K to five in Somerville will move uh, away from worksheets, um, at least as nightly homework, and really focus on, on reading. Thank you, Emily. Ken. Excuse me. Um, can I get that question one more time? You want to Sure, Ken. The effectiveness of homework for elementary school students is currently a matter of debate. And I think mostly by the elementary school students. But, uh, <laughs> where, where do you stand on that issue of homework? From door knocking and talking to the parents, they say there's an awful lot of homework. Um, I think homework's good. I think it keeps the kids on top of things. And I, don't, I don't like to see them have a whole lot of homework. I think more than an hour's worth of homework is more than efficient. But I think that homework is it, it, it's, it's good. It expands the child's mind. But I think the um, the homework that they give now is, is a little heavy, I think, from what I hear from parents. But it's important. Homework, <clears throat> me going to school, I didn't like homework. But I knew how important it was. My parents made sure I did my homework. I just don't want to see them overload the child with homework. So they're, they're learning in school. They need homework. That keeps their mind fresh before, before dinner. Then they start all over the day after. Homework's important. So I guess it's limited. You don't want to do too much where the child gets overwhelmed. Because we have a lot of single parents in the neighborhood, and by the time they cook, by the time they get home, by the time they cook dinner, yeah, it's really, it's really hard on the parents to uh, sit with their child. Again, that's why I started a homework club where parents volunteer, help the child with the homework. Those are the important things. Yeah. You gotta help these parents out. We have so many single parents in the neighborhood. You gotta help them out. And we have the resources to do it. Every time I hear, we don't have the money. I don't want to hear that anymore. I'm tired of hearing that. We have plenty of money in the city. Plenty of money. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. I'm going to stay with the kids for a bit. How's that? That works. And you're going to get this question, too. 
The current Somerville School Board disciplinary policy allows for the suspension and dismissal of students as young as pre-K for behavioral infractions. Do you support the policy? And if you do, why? And if you don't, how do you redefine the disciplinary policy for these kids? I can't. I, I've heard some horror stories from talking to parents, and sometimes I, I, I ask myself, are they telling me the truth? I don't believe in that. I don't. Th I believe they should be expelled or suspended in uh, kindergarten, first grade, second grade. It depends on really what what, what the issue is. It's it's it's, it's based on. Uh, what the issue is. So spending a child in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, that's unacceptable to me. You know, as it gets older, as fifth grade, sixth grade, it, 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 it's a case by case basis. You know, you gotta you gotta look at everything's different. You gotta that's that's crazy. I, I, I wouldn't support that. Devin said I could do a follow up if I chose to. How about for bullying? Bullying, I have an anti bullying program, be a buddy, not a bully. You know, parents tell me by door knocking that our kids are getting bullied. They take them out of the East Summerville and send them to Winter Hill. You know, it, it, it is an issue in our schools that kids are getting bullied. I don't have to tell you, it's all over the country. What happened? You know, I was a victim of a bully. I had six brothers, but I never ran home and told my brothers, hey, such and such was bullying me. You know, it's happening. And, you know, I believe the administration, I, I, I shouldn't say the administration, let me clarify it. The school committee, you know, they know what's going on, but they don't say, they, they really don't do anything about it. And uh, I have a program that it's called Be a Buddy, Not a Bully. And when, when, when a child is bullied, the next day we take care of it. What happens is the city waits three or four days, does an investigation. By that time, the, the, the kid doesn't want to go to school. He drops out on it. Does, it just it affects him physically and mentally. And, you know, enough's so enough. You know, and we need to get hit that right, right when it starts. Bring the victim, the bully, the parents into the into the office and work it out and tell them this is unacceptable. And if we fix it, then it won't expand, it won't explode because a lot of the bully and the victim, the victim especially, holds inside. He doesn't want to tell anybody. He tells his mom, "Oh, mom, that was wrong." But there is something wrong, and I don't have to tell you what what a, what a bully turns into. Thanks, Ken. Thank you, Emily. Repeat the question. If you don't mind. Sure thing. Current Somerville School Board disciplinary policy allows for the suspension and dismissal of students as young as pre-K for behavioral infractions. Do you support the policy? If you do, why? If you don't, how do you redefine the disciplinary policy for the youngest students? Uh, okay. Uh, I agree with Ken here. I think um, suspension and uh, expulsion of young children is uncomfortable. And I don't think, I think it means that um, enough, not enough has been done um, to, to work with these kids and work with the families. Uh, bullying is problematic. Um, often the challenges are in the homes of the bully as well as the victim. And uh, often, I think many of us have seen this, experienced it, kids act out because they want affection, because they want attention. Um, it's very rare that a bully is a bully because they are just a mean, terrible person, especially at a young age. You can't say that about young children. Um, so I would like to see, I think this is something that the school committee is actually working on already. I know that they're working on developing and implementing a comprehensive social emotional learning framework, um, which is, I think, to help kids sort of realize um, what, you know, what healthy emotions look like and how to talk to people about their feelings. Um, and so I think in redefining, I think that that would help redefine. Um, and then, I think I answered the question. You did? Okay. You want to keep going? You got more time there. Um, let me let me ask. I'm going to take a little liberty here. Then, go for it. That's okay. Let me ask. Let both of you. Mm -hmm. In the case of severe bullying, in the second grade, fourth grade, let's stay with those two. Mm -hmm. Multiple dis disciplinary hearings with the parents for a child, say in that age range. What's your recommendation? I don't want to go first. Sure. 
Uh, my recommendation would be probably in an intensive program, whether it's bringing something into the school, um, you know, if the kid has to go out of school for some of it. Um, you know, I think the challenge, it's a wonderful ideal to think that you can bring the parents in and have them be ta talk to and have the principal talk to them, but um, you can't compel parents to come in and sometimes parents don't have the time or the interest, um, as sad as that is. And so I think it's working with the child, finding finding what's best for them. If they're not staying in their classroom necessarily, keeping them in a school at least so they don't feel like they Ken, what do you think? So what you say, second, fourth grade? Yeah, second grade, third grade, fourth grade. I would throw them in jail. That's what I would do. No, I'm only kidding. No, I'm only kidding. That, you know, if you, you would give them, um, you, 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 you got to get the parent in. If the parent doesn't want to come in, then there's an issue with the parent. If this goes on, this is going on. I'm telling you, I've seen it myself. I've talked to the parents. If the parent doesn't want to go in, then we got a situation. That's when I would say, you know what? If you can't make the time to come in and, sit, and, and evaluate the situation or something, the first sign understandable. You know, the, the principal would have the authority to say, listen, this is going on, but you have to get the parents in. If the parent can't make the time, then there's an issue. Second time it happens, then it's a reoccurrence. So the, 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 there's a bigger issue that you go on. And that's when we would say, you know what? I think it's time for a suspension. If that doesn't work, third time then it's time for this child to be um, reprimanded somewhere. I, I don't like a spell in children unless it's a serious issue. And again, we're talking about second and fourth grade children. If you explain to the kids, it, it can't go on, but if it's a reoccurrence, it's a serious issue. And the parents need to take responsibility for their child at that age. Parents don't take responsibility. If they can't make the time to come in, then there's an issue with the parent. Again, I don't want to blame the parent, but there's an issue going on at home, maybe. Something's up, but if it's a reoccurring issue that's not being addressed. You need to put your foot down. You can't be band-aiding issues like this because all over the country you can see what happens with, and when, when a bully, decide, when, a, when a victim turns into a, uh, actually, excuse me, a bully turns into a victim, a victim turns into a bully. That's the cycle. It's a vicious cycle. If the parents can't make the time, then we got an issue with the parent. She needs to be brought into the office. And I leave that up to the, the principals of the school. We got great, we got an awesome principal at the D. Solo. We got great principal at the Monte Hill. We got awesome headmasters at the Summer High School. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Next question Emily, mm -hmm. what specific educational policies would you recommend or support to improve educational attainment for Somerville children in grades K through 8? Mm -hmm. Additionally, Two part. Oh, okay. Two part. What recommendations do you have to improve learning resources in the new high school? Uh, okay. Improve educational policies, recommend or support for K through eight. Um so the policies that I I think I'm going to advocate for most strongly is um, kind of pre-K through eight. I think having universal access to pre-K so that all families who pay taxes here feel um, that their kids have access. Getting kids a strong start is a really great way um, to give them good foundation so that their academic learning is stronger as they as they get older. Um, so pre-K is important to me. Uh, summer programs and are important, so that's uh, another policy that I will advocate for. Um, figuring out inexpensive or free academically, and it doesn't have to be academically rigorous, but academically supportive summer programs um, to help give kids a strong start throughout the academic year so they're not um, losing learning over the summer, which can happen for students. Uh, those are two policies off the top of my head. Um, what are learning resources that I'd recommend for the high school? Um, so I think Somerville is good at working with community partners. I think the Somerville Public Schools could be a lot better. And so I, what I would try and do is reach out to 
um, current community resources and sort of see what their thoughts are and uh, probably <coughs> build on that. Thanks, Emily. Yeah. Ken, I'm going to repeat that question. What specific educational policies would you recommend or support to improve the educational attainment of Somerville children in grades K through eight? And additionally, what kind of recommendations do you want to see implemented to improve the learning resources in the new high school? Good question. No, so we're, we're, we're lucky in some We have an alternative school down in uh, Cross Street. We have the next wave in full circle. That gives the children a second chance if they decide to drop out. I want to bring everything under one roof instead of separating down there and have them go to high school. Bring everything to the high, the new high school that we're building. Keep full circle next week in the high school and implement that all under one roof so they feel like they're included. They feel like they're, 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 they're separated from what, what I've talked to, students that I've talked to. Keep it under one roof. Again, we're lucky to have those programs because I know a lot of children, I should say students, they would have dropped out if we didn't have that opportunity to send them to the next wave in full circle. But I want to bring them all under one roof instead of sending them to different schools, for instance, the next wave in full circle. Bring them all under one roof so they feel like they're, in a, they're part of the, the, the school system. Right now, they don't feel like they're part of the school system. They feel like they're outcasts because they're in another school. They get the same, almost the same diploma. It said, by law, it is. And, you know, you just, they feel like they're left out. And they feel uncomfortable and they act out. And they, some of them don't like going to school because they, because they, they get called in names, for instance, full service and all that. that. That's what I want to do. I want to bring everything under one roof with the new high school. We have the room. We're, again, we're building a $253 million high school. But for that kind of money, my goodness, we could build a circus in the backyard. So we, 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 we have the money and store it, let's bring us all under one roof and make them feel like they're part of, the, part of the school system. Right now, they don't feel like they're part of the school system. And that's what we need to do. Again, we need to educate the parent, let them know that they, they need to be on board with it. And I, most of them are. And parents tell me they don't feel like their kids are a part of the school system because they're, they're sent to another school. You can have one wing for the full circle and next week. All in one building. And I can't wait for it. I'll tell you that. It's going to be beautiful. I mean, you people are going to pay for it. <laughs> Over the next 20 years, I'm told. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Thank you. So, Ken, speaking of paying for stuff, if the city received a million dollar grant, with the only caveat being that it needs to be spent on forward thinking for the students, what would you advise the superintendent to spend that on? I would say, let's cut down the classroom sizes and give it to the teachers. Let them decide where it goes. Again, you know, by electing uh, me or Emily, it's, it's not our voice up there, it's your voice. That's a lot of money, and let the teachers decide where that money should go, because they know better than I do where the money should go, and the principal, and let them decide. Let the, the teachers decide and the parents decide. And that's like when I when I hold my meetings. Hopefully, I get elected. I, when I hold my meetings once a month, we can discuss that. That would be that would, that would be awesome. Well, we already got several million dollars from the one casino. Where's that? Where, where's that money going? Did that go in the school system? And I challenge. I'm, I'm the only candidate that's taking a five thousand dollar pay cut. I ask every elected official, every candidate, to match me. If I can afford to take a five thousand dollar pay cut, why well, can't they? Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Emily, uh, if the city received a million dollar grant, with the only caveat being that it needs to be spent on forward thinking for the students, what would you advise the superintendent to spend it on? Um, so I love Ken's idea of, of talking to the teachers. I think talking to the teachers and getting their input is huge um, because they do know their students best. Um, but thinking about our community, I think policies that would be most forward thinking, probably are technology based, trying to get um, computers for kids, seeing if we can figure out, um, does the money have to be spent in schools or it's just forward thinking policies? 
If you would ask me, that would be under the grant conditions. Okay. Well, so then I'm going to say that uh, I think that internet is something that has become essential to student learning, and um, that's definitely been something that is there's a gap for for kids who are high need, and uh, so I think I would. Try and figure out if there are ways to use some of that money uh, to get high speed internet to low income students. Um, I think one to one computers uh, or some sort of tablet. Um, and then I think uh, language learning would also be good um, because you know teachers need to communicate. So if we can fund um, them taking classes in uh, a language that they don't already speak to improve their communication with parents or anyone else, or frankly, fun classes for teachers that would help them, like Ken said, do do what they think is best to improve students. I, I think those would also all be great ways of sending money. Great, thank you. Devin told me I could ask a question. The superintendent of the city of Somerville schools is Mary Skipper. What does she do for recreation in the summertime and it involves a vehicle? Uh, okay. Can I oh. <laughs> she rides a motorcycle with her husband. <laughs> Let's go to the final question because we're gonna wrap this up. This is a multiple part question. And feel free to ask me to slow down, repeat, and take it apart. Just as easy as you can answer it. The current neighborhood choice school policy has resulted in an intra-district primary schools that are demographically unbalanced. For example, the Brown School is 75% white, with only 23% of the students coming from low-income households. East Somerville Community School is 18% white, with 85% of the students coming from low-income households. The source for that is great schools. These statistics suggest that the neighborhood choice policy may be creating built-in inequities in each school based on the demographics of the neighborhoods they are in. However, the policy is favored by many parents who value having their children go to a nearby school. Would you support keeping or changing the neighborhood choice school policy? What's your rationale for keeping and changing it? And if you want to change it, what changes would you support? In a nutshell, I think you know what that question is driving at. Emily, you want to take it first? Sure. Um, so there's a you know a challenge in all of that because I live around the corner from the East Somerville Community School. I have a one-year-old and a two-year-old who I hope to send to that school because it is a great school, but it's also super close. Um, so I understand that. Uh, I grew up attending Cambridge Public Schools, and in Cambridge, they have a very complicated um, choice program that took race into account. Um, Due to changes in federal law, it's, we're actually not allowed to do that. So any any policy that would ideally take race into account um, as uh, as kids are going or choosing schools or families are choosing schools aren't permitted anymore. Um, I think another challenge with doing away with the neighborhood program is that we would have to pay for busing. So that would be an increase in the budget. Um, Objectively, I think it's a great idea. I think if we were to to do it, um, probably factoring in, because we can't factor in race, we factor in sort of socioeconomic status, which is usually in, in schools based on whether kids get free or reduced lunch or not. So um, if we try and do balancing of how many kids do or do not receive free or reduced lunch in each school while taking busing into account, um, I think that would be an ideal way to achieve more balance between the schools. Um, Thanks, Emily. Yeah. Okay. Want to break that question yeah, apart? I need to keep asking him. Oh, uh, that's perfectly fine. Devin can't formulate these questions, questions anymore. She she has to learn that they have to be very quick and succinct. Yeah. She's Just kidding, Dev. 
The current neighborhood choice school policy has resulted in intra-district primary schools that are demographically unbalanced. For example, the Brown School is 71% white, with only 23% of the students coming from low-income households. The Somerville Community School is 18% white, with 85% of the students coming from low-income households. And the source for that is great schools. The statistics are suggesting that the neighborhood choice policy may create built-in inequities in each school based on the demographics of the neighborhoods they're in. People of color, people of low income go to a certain school because it's in that low income neighborhood. Right. I so, so here's the question. Do you want to keep that policy, neighborhood choice, or do you want to change it? What's the rationale for keeping or changing it? I wouldn't want to change it. I might tweak it a little bit. Uh, and you know, make it a level playing field. You know, you can't give to one and not the other. You just balance it all, make it work if you want. You know, but busing and stuff. I just what confuses me. I don't want to keep popping on, but what confuses me if you live in this neighborhood and you got to go to Winter Hill or um, the Healy, it doesn't make sense. It, it seems like it, it's going to cost us more money. If you live in the neighborhood, you should be able to go to your neighborhood school. That's not what I think. I would tweak it a little bit, but I wouldn't change it. I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't uh, favoritism one thing and not the other. Balance it out, make it work. If we took the time, spent some, 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 some time on it, I think we can make it work. Again, I don't want to favoritism one side and not the other. Let's level it out, make it work. If we come together, we can make it work. I don't, like I said, I don't like to change anything that's already <coughs> implemented, but we can tweak it and we can make it work. We can, again, we have the money. This city has got dope. The city is loaded. <laughs> So we can make it work. At this time, I think if I see the money coming in, <coughs> taxes are increasing, current stickers, water bill, I got my water bill. I don't even want to get on that. I'll let the water all the way in. The water all the way in. It's handle that. But tweak it. That's right. I wouldn't want to change it, Joe. But I would like to tweak it a little bit to make it a little, a little uh, level player field. Excellent. Thank you, Ken. No, thank you, Joe. You know, we, we have um, successfully gone through all the questions that East Somerville Main Streets wanted to ask you. So now it's your turn. Take two minutes for a closing statement, and I'm gonna leave it to these wonderfully well-behaved candidates to make a decision as to who wants to go first. Ken, do you want to You know, I was raised as always, raised before gentlemen, if you don't mind, I'm like, oh, all right. Thank you. My pleasure. Um, so first off, thank you to Joe again, and thank you to everyone who submitted these awesome questions. It was really thought-provoking for me, um, and hopefully will inform me as I move forward over the next few weeks before the election. Um, so, our public schools comprise almost one-third of Somerville's budget. The school committee oversees that money and is tasked with spending it wisely to serve our 5,000 students and create a new generation of informed citizens who are prepared for life and work in the 21st century. I have significant professional experience as an elementary school teacher, a district leader, a state policy analyst, and an education researcher studying effective summer programs. As a school committee member, I will put that experience to work in order to craft well thought out educational policies that will keep Somerville schools improving at this remarkable rate that they're already on. I love you, Somerville, and I'm invested in our community. I volunteered with Next Wave Full Circle at their Christmas tree sale. Um, I've met those kids, I've been in that school. Um, it's, it's a really nice place. Uh, I'm currently on the board of directors of East Somerville Main Streets. I'm a former teacher, I'm a homeowner, and importantly, I'm a parent. While my children are too young for Somerville Public Schools right now, I'm excited to see them go to the Capuano and East Somerville Community School in a few short years, um, if we still have a neighborhood choice program. Um, the schools that I want for my children are the schools that I want for all children. I'm eager to put my decade plus of experience in education to work, to help Somerville Public Schools improve and to meet the needs of our students. Uh, please vote for me, Emily Ackman, for Ward 1 School Committee on Tuesday, November 7th. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Ken Salvato, closing statement. All right, thank you, Ron. Thank you for listening to me. Uh, you know, I didn't just wake up one morning and say I want to be school uh, school committee. 
I, I, I've been involved in this community a long, long time. I've lived here, and my family's raised their family here, you know, I've been here for 40 years. You know, I care a lot about this community. I care a lot about my ward. You know, our ward is one of the best wards in the city. I don't have to tell you that. I care about our schools, I care about our kids, I care about our teachers. I would, I would love your support you know, on November 7th. I have all these programs I've already started two years ago, you know, and this, you know, it's just sad that the way they're spending our tax dollars when they should, should be spending it on our schools, you know, our schools are going to be our lawyers, our doctors, our teachers, you know, our, all our nurses, our, it's just, you know, it's just, we need to keep an eye on this, it's, it's out of control and we need to keep an eye on our schools, you know, we've we got to make sure that we get every dollar we spend Get, get our bank for our buckets, they say. You know, we've got a great community. You know, I'm, gonna, I'm not going anywhere. You know, I'm not going anywhere. I've been, I've been in politics since 91, trying to, <laughs> trying like a son of a man to win one of these seats. And, you know, you know, a lot of you know that I'm committed to this neighborhood. I'm not going to lock your doors. I've spoke to a lot of you. You invited me in your homes. You invited me in your backyard. You invited me in your cookouts. You know, again, I'm not going anywhere. You know, I'm, I'm going to be here for a long time. And, you know, I don't even turn on the so, you know. Four terms, it's time to move on. What's happening is they get comfortable in their position and they're up there for 25 years and no one gets an opportunity to, to bring new ideas there. So I asked the Earth's one on November 7th, you know, I don't have a whole lot of education, but I'll tell you what, I'm going to be a full time school committee representative. I'll live on Brook, Brook Street for five, six years, and you know, I, it's here, it's here. So I'm here, it's here, it's in the heart. You know, I can do a lot of great things. Like I said, I already started the program. Two years ago. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies to you. For you have two candidates for Ward 1 School Committee. Emily Ackman, Ken On behalf of East Somerville Main Street, thank you for coming. I'm Joe Lynch from Somerville Media Center. Thanks for watching.